to only travel at unit speed at all times, then this is going to be not a linear constraint in velocity anymore because I'm taking a norm of my velocity vector. I don't know that that's necessarily practical, but it, it at least demonstrates that, okay, in, even in really simple situations, linear constraints are probably not enough. And also at some point in the presentation, you mentioned that by plugging the Lie group integrator and the, and the fact of using this uh, connection into the variational principle integrator, that's when you get constraints formulated easily as kinematic constraints. So I was wondering, can you, you also use some of the theory that you're developing, the Lie group integrator part and the, and the way of describing the non holonomic constraints without resorting to the variational principles or it all becomes nice because you put the three ingredients together? Yeah, I mean, you probably could go about driving the integrators um, without the variational principles, but it's going to get really hairy. Um, the nice thing about starting with a variational perspective is it's really easy to choose numerical or uh, quadrature in time. You know exactly how it's going to behave. You don't have to guess, you know, is this integrator really going to preserve the right momentum and so on. You, you sort of have guarantees that if you start with a variational principle, you don't have to worry about what the numerical behavior is going to be. Um, so you probably could go about developing similar integrators without the principles, but um, I wouldn't personally do that. Okay. <laughs> and the last one, um, let's say you have examples where maybe your configuration space is a bit more difficult to describe, or I was thinking articulated bodies or something, I don't know, where typically people uh, formulate the holonomy constraints. So I'm not, I'm a bit confused, like how would that fit in, in your theory? Uh, Often people, uh, the way we work with explicit integrators, so, so we turn those uh, holom holonomic constraints on positions, actually we differentiate them, yep. and we have constraints on velocities. Yep. If we want to do that in your framework, would you do fit, even though they are not no holonomic constraints, would you handle them on velocities, or could you also ha uh, handle them directly on yeah. the configuration space? Uh, actually, so any, uh, holonomic constraint can be viewed as a linear constraint on velocity. So actually if you wanted to, you could use what we call a non-holonomic connection to encode holonomic constraints. Um, in the paper actually we didn't take that route. We did a few holonomic examples, but we didn't take the route of using the non-holonomic connection to encode those constraints. So I don't know exactly how it behaves numerically, but it should behave uh, just as well. Thank you. Okay, Paul. Uh, very nice presentation by the way. Thank you. Um, so, I had a, uh, I was wondering actually the implications of using uh, the uh, Cayley map as opposed to the exponential map and this is something that uh, didn't come out in the presentation but I feel that there must be some intuition as to some, something that might be, some implication on the error or, uh -huh. or speed. Right, so in the paper we use, um, instead of the exponential map sometimes we use this Cayley map uh, which is an approximation to the exponential map that's easier to compute. Um, in, in all the vehicles we tried and all the tests we've run, it's a very accurate approximation. Um, and so we, it doesn't, doesn't really cause so, the same so trouble. So even with large time steps, there's no... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I think I've, I've done some error plots and if you make your time step insanely large, then yeah, you start seeing error in the Cayley map. But usually it's a very, very good approximation for the exponential map. So uh, also on the long, along the lines of the uh, holonomic constraints, I'm wondering if uh, you have any thoughts on unilateral constraints. Uh, um, and this, is it just use a standard approach or? Uh, I guess I don't know what unilateral constraints well, in terms are. Of, like con intermittent contact. Like uh, you have uh, your car, you're parking your car and uh, I see. you're Steve McQueen and you go yeah. airborne. Yeah, I see. Um, so our connection depends on the pose. So our, our matrix A depends on the, the pose or the configuration Q. So in principle, you could have that kind of dependence, but it's going to have to be differentiable. So if you are in contact and you leave the ground, somewhere in between, there has to be sort of a smooth shift between having the, the constraints and not having the constraints. So it might get pretty hairy. And uh, just generally in, in contact gets to be uh, pretty tricky. But that would be an interesting thing to look at for sure. Uh, hi. Um, I'm thinking of how this might um, apply to being used not necessarily by an animator but by uh, a, a developer wanting to control like a, an AI vehicle, for example. And uh, sometimes that's done through the physics simulation and they'll use a, a PID controller to uh, add in correction to a steering direction and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. 
Um, if, if you are familiar with a, a PID controller, I was wondering if you might um, uh, compare the two if, if you, this was to be used towards that approach. Sure. So it sounds like you could probably just plug this PID controller into our integrator to get the controls. So the way our integrator works is you can plug in some arbitrary set of controls like whatever the driver is doing with the steering wheel at a given point in time and the integrator will come up with the, the trajectory of the vehicle. So really you're free to use any kind of controller you want. Um, okay, last question. Okay, hi. This um, relates to Paul's question. Um, how do you compute the mass risk exponential and do you see any numerical issues with that? Right? I mean, computing the matrix exponential is not only difficult in terms of time, it's also known to be numerically yeah. difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we did it by calling XM in MATLAB. <laughs> <laughs> so I think those guys, uh, you know, they think about these issues and hopefully get it right. But as I also mentioned, we often use this approximation called the Cayley map, which is a much simpler way uh, to approximate the exponential map and works quite well in practice. Okay, I actually got two quick questions uh, via, via email that you can maybe just address quickly or, or, okay. or move on. So first one is about SCID, uh, where the non-holonomic constraint ceases to be a hard constraint past a certain threshold governed by friction. And the question is whether you've considered an extension like that. Yeah, so this is basically just something I put in future work, which is how do we deal with more general types of friction? So we can sort of deal with situations that are a lot like infinite static friction. Um, but yeah, figuring out a nice way to encode friction with the, with the connection is definitely something interesting to look at. Okay. And then the second question is a bit more technical. It's uh, in the comparison against the ORK methods for SE3 examples, a renormalization of the quaternions at every step of the ORK methods is performed. And does this change the order of accuracy, for example, ORK4? because uh, Sam Boos in a 2001 computational physics paper noted that naive RK methods were limited to second order accuracy when applied to rigid body rotations. So I actually have a slide on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. Okay, with that, let's thank our last speaker, uh, all our speakers.